My name is Andrew Whiting, I'm a PhD student here. Uh, this paper that I'm going to be presenting today is associated with the edited volume that goes alongside uh, this particular project. Uh, I co-authored it alongside Dr Lee Jarvis and Lila Nori, who are going to be coming up towards the end to, to talk about the discussion. Uh, so, the overarching aim of the paper is to engage in cyberterrorism as a concept, and um, it does this based around three key questions. The first is, how is cyberterrorism understood? So what is it that people mean when they refer to the concept? Um, what different attempts have been made to define it? And we find that this throws up quite a lot of issues surrounding the contestability of the concept. Uh, the second key question is, it, we, we kind of take a step backwards and we ask, actually is it valuable? Should we locate um, the cyber activities and cyber behaviours that are often labelled cyber terrorism within the broader concept of terrorism? And the final question is, kind of remember, talk to the first two, and we, we look at how best we can respond to some of these issues how we can push forward the research agenda surrounding cyber-terrorism, despite uh, some of the definitional problems that surround it. So some, uh, some, some world going some world on the ground here, but kind of very briefly just talking about the internet and cyber-terrorism. Um, so while the internet has, has shrunk social space, accelerated social time, it's given us um, the ease which we can certain concepts like uh, email and web chat, things like this. Um, it's also got a darker side to it and we see concepts like cyber terrorism, like hacking, computer viruses that wouldn't have existed uh, previous to the internet. And this quote here by um, Paul Meridio kind of just sums up how this isn't anything uh, particularly unique about the internet. Whenever we come up, stumble across a new invention or we go into a new forefront, we, we, <coughs> the benefits we gain from it are also kind of counteracted by certain risks. And the thing is that a lot of these threats and risks are, are not very well understood, there's not a lot of coherence surrounding them, especially in relation to cyberspace. And as a result, there's very little consensus of what we're actually talking about when we refer to cyber terrorism. So, despite the term being coined in the 1980s, uh, the concept saw an upturn in prevalence around the 1990s, and we highlight two key dynamics as to why this is the case. Um, the first is to do with the end of the Cold War and, and the end of uh, almost half a century concentrating on a very well known, well understood threat. Um, and so, this spawned a desire amongst uh, governments and policy circles and security experts to try and find out what it is, that's, what the new threats are going to be. And this coincides with uh, an increase in independence and uh, the explosion of the internet, really. So we see the network as a, as a principal organising um, organizing kind of factor. However, despite this kind of increased prevalence of the, of the term, again, there's not really necessarily any more coherence around it. So to get on to the first kind of key question, we, um, we ask, why is it that uh, there is this lack of understanding? And we have four, four factors for this. First of all, we've got the temporal questions. And this refers to how significant a, 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 a tax preparations, means are, things like that, and as to how we label it. And this is where we get towards narrow, narrow understandings of cyber-terrorism and broader understanding. So a generic example of a, of a narrow understanding might be looking at cyber-terrorism as uh, a computer-based attack on computer networks, perhaps leading to some kind of physical, physical destruction. Uh, on the other hand, you have these broader understandings that although accept accepting these narrow understandings as examples of cyber-terrorism, they tend to typologise between the two and they'll, they'll highlight these as examples of pure cyber-terrorism or true cyber-terrorism. While on the, other, on the other hand, looking at the concept much broader and saying actually any kind of terrorist use of the internet is an example of cyber-terrorism. And this kind of overlaps with the second question, this question of disruptiveness. So should the term be restricted to attacks um, or is it actually should it be employed for any terrorist usage of the internet? Well, if we agree with this kind of latter point, then it, it's obvious that the concept's going to become very broad. Um, preparation online, uh, reconnaissance, propaganda, all this is going to be an uh, example of cyber terrorism. And thus, you could argue that any kind of contemporary example of terrorism is going to have at least an element of cyber terrorism within it, if not being an example of cyber terrorism itself. A third point is to do with this um, emergence of, uh, of a kind of distinct cyber terminology. I'm not aware of any other concept really that's uh, so kind of young, apparently, but at the same time has such a kind of um, such a load of terms surrounding it. So we have some examples there: cyber terrorism, cyber crime, hacktivism, cyber warfare, and the list goes on. And if you look at these optimistically, you could say they provide a useful um, kind of conceptual compartmentalisation. But actually, the reality seems to be that they all exist in, in the same kind of grey area. They all overlap with each other. And so, what one person will refer to as hacktivism, somebody else will refer to as cyber terrorism. Somebody else may think that the two kind of go together, and you can, you can have an example that's both. And so actually, we argue that it becomes less clear um, as to what each term is referring to. The final point here is to do with uh, media hyperbole uh, and the fear of the unknown. And so, 
this idea that what we don't understand tends to scare us. And this kind of combined with um, the media's desire to, to, to sell news stories um, relates, in, and we've, we talked about it in the last panel a bit, a bit just now actually, it's kind of media scaremongering. So they're kind of undue focus on nightmare scenarios and hypothetical scenarios of air traffic control and life support, stuff like that. And we argue this, does, this has a knock-on effect on, on how we think of cyber terrorism because it's, it's portrayed uh, in popular media as a, as a very kind of plausible and catastrophic uh, concept. So, so yeah, these, those four factors are, are examples of factors that have kind of undermined our confidence in the term. Um, so then we go on to look at the, look at the second particular question, which is um, to do with, you know, we take a step backwards here and we say, is it possible or valuable to describe these behaviours actually as terrorism proper? Um, and we immediately kind of come up with some, again, some problems here because of the shifting historical meaning and, and the evolution of the concept of terrorism. So without going into, into a full-blown history of the concept, and again this has been discussed a couple of times already today, it, it is, its first usage tends to be referring to uh, actions by the state around the time of the French Revolution. It's, it seems to be devoid of those um, negative connotations and the pejorativeness that we, we associate with today. And even if you fast forward to the end of uh, the Second World War and it, its usage uh, for anti-colonial movements, it's still kind of lacking that illegitimacy that we that surround it today. Um, and so this, this kind of raises the point that if, if we're not entirely sure what, what terrorism is, it doesn't seem to be a particularly settled concept, then how is it we can say with much confidence that cyber terrorism can simply be defined away? Um, but on the other, the other hand, you to, if you are to say as a result of that, yes, okay, th then we should look at these behaviours as examples of terrorism. You then got the issue of that it, it might fail to meet up with the criteria of commonly understood definitions of terrorism. So, where is necessarily, where is necessarily the violence or the performance in the theatrical elements um, that tend to be synonymous with, with terrorism? So, then we kind of get on to the, I guess, the, the main part of the presentation, um, and we look at how we can respond to some of these challenges. Um, and we come up with three potential routes here. Um, that's how we can push forward the research agenda. Well, in the, in the case of the first one, it's actually to treat cyber terrorism as a misnomer. And so, although we might say that cyber threats are quite real and potentially dangerous, maybe there's not much value, or there's limited value, in referring to them as, as terrorism. So with this option, maybe we disband with the concept, and, uh, at least for now, and, and, look, and look at other kind of research agendas. The second is to engage in, in greater definitional work. Um, this could have added ethical, analytical, or practical benefits. Uh, but equally, it might come against the same problems we're finding now. If you look back at the parent concept of terrorism and, and the contestability that surrounds that, it might be that we can't make too much headway. So the, the third route, and, and what we pay attention to, is actually that we redirect our attention. So we don't look necessarily at what cyber terrorism is, but we, uh, we look at how it's been produced in discourse, how it's been constructed. Um, we don't necessarily look at it as an object of knowledge anymore, but we take it on as a, as a social construction. So this, uh, these kind of studies, uh, kind of take inspiration from a recent rise in constructivist and critical terrorism research and um, they're premised around three ontological claims which are up here. Um, that the world around us is constituted in part by our ideas about it. There's no direct objective link between our ideas and the world of things and that these two dimensions interact so that our ideas and social reality to shape, reinforce and impact upon one another. And so with this kind of ontological starting point you can probably see that this approach is going to lead to kind of different research questions and much different research agenda than a more conventional, traditional approach to terrorism studies. And so, this is, this is kind of the final slide and a bit of a conclusion at the end, but we, we ask about, instead of just putting that forward, we also say, say what kind of research avenues could we pursue if we take this approach? And we've come up with four. Um, the first is to look at, just look at how cyber terrorism has been constructed, so what language is used, how does that structure the debate, and what are the implications of this? We can also ask about how cyber terrorism is positioned both, both spatially and temporally. So, uh, is it seen as an internal or external threat? Uh, is its perceived newness used to exaggerate a threat? And also, having a look at how the constructions of cyber terrorism, whether they're consistent or not. So, is there one kind of overarching accepted construction of cyber terrorism? Are there lots of kind of, are there other kind of deviant ones or, or several constructions vying to be that accepted norm? Second research avenue is looking at uh, intertextualities uh, with discourses on terrorism uh, and other security challenges. So. Here we can look at to what extent constructions of cyber terrorism build on those of terrorism. Um, is the same language is used, or do we have like distinct rubrics of work here? Also, what effect does uh, the cyber prefix have on, on, ter on terrorism more broadly? So we can look back at some of the work done on the terrorism discourse and see what effect the cyber prefix is having uh, within the cyber terrorism discourse. And also, interestingly, the idea of 
how different representations of cyber terrorism draw upon each other. So what impact are media representations having on uh, policy implications or policy uh, representations or legal representations? What, what impact is fictional dis discourse having, for example? The third uh, research avenue is the performative aspect. So what is it that cyber terrorism does? And this, this could be the one that potentially has the most uh, policy relevance. So um, how do certain representations foreclose or encourage particular behaviour? How do they apportion responsibility and to who? And also, where do the questions of rights, legitimacy, and justice emerge in these discussions? The final research avenue we've got there is, is simply to do with questions of interest. So, are there, are there economic, political, or military benefits to, to these uh, constructions? And if so, for who and how? Uh, so, for, uh, as a kind of final thing here, thinking about the implications as a conclusion here, um, we argue that this kind of approach, uh, adopting this, this constructivist approach, would allow us to engage with cyber terrorism despite some of the issues that have been raised. Even just, even just today, like some definitional problems, we, we might be able to push forward in a different direction and further the research agenda. However, we're aware that there might be some, we might be held back by particular um, limitations, and primarily, I guess, one of those would be policy relevance, because these kind of approaches are unlikely to ask questions like, how can we respond to cyber terrorism? Or what is cyber terrorism?